The capital of Indonesia, the fourth most populous country in the world, is moving. Which is an odd move, considering that by 2030, Jakarta is set to overtake Tokyo to become the largest city on Earth, according to Euromonitor. Though there are some very good reasons for this, Jakarta is sinking. The city is built on a swamp, at just 8 meters above sea level, and sinking fast. But it's the location of the new capital which is just as startling. Jakarta's replacement will move away from the world's most populated island of Java to Borneo. This move was about sending a statement that Indonesia and its economy are diverse, spread over more than 17,000 islands. And this is a great example of its geographical challenges, which is just as essential to understanding Indonesia's economy as any economic model or statistic. Economics is a social science at its heart, incorporating many different disciplines into one. And as such, it's important not to get lost in any one factor, with Indonesia being the perfect example of how this can play out in practice an archipelago spanning a distance equivalent to one-eighth of the Earth's circumference. The country has been blessed with a wealth of natural resources, or in economics terms, commodities. This list of commodities includes large quantities of oil, natural gas, timber, and the list goes on. Crucially, this wealth of natural resources has by and large been the bedrock upon which the Indonesian economy has been built, particularly when it comes to its exports why Indonesia isn't following the typical development model. If you wanted to put Indonesia's economy in context, comparing it to its neighbours is a good place to start. Malaysia and Thailand, countries with populations which are four and eight times smaller than it. Indonesia doesn't appear to be as interconnected with the world. It has fewer top global firms, less overseas investment holdings, considerably smaller high-tech exports, fewer patents, and not one university ranked in the top 800 in the world. And remember, this is an economy which is tipped to be a world leader in less than a decade. So when we think about a developing economy, more often than not, a familiar pattern of development emerges. One based on a transition from agriculture to manufacturing, a comparative advantage in cheap labour, slowly climbing its way up the value chain, which finally propels it into developed country status. And a lot of these factors are relevant to Indonesia's own economic journey. But there is a big exception here. Indonesia's heavy reliance on commodities, as opposed to manufacturing. The nation is awash with natural resources on both land and sea. Historically a member of OPEC, but a net importer of oil since 2003. Luckily for Indonesia, the 2000s were the perfect time to cash in on commodities. You see, the world has just been through a commodity super cycle, meaning in general commodity prices were up as part of a longer term trend. The source of this demand also happened to be right on Indonesia's doorstep. Asia accounted for two thirds of global growth between 2000 and 2017, growth led by China, which became Indonesia's largest trading partner in 2016. Yet, this super cycle has pretty much come to an end as China pivots its economy away from manufacturing and towards services. The high prices fetched for Indonesia's commodities have declined, with the impact on its economy being pretty clear. Exports as a percentage of GDP have dropped in both relative and absolute terms. Though whilst commodities have declined, non-commodity exports haven't taken off in their absence. Besides looking at the raw stats, a good indicator of how successful a country's manufacturing sector is, is its role in the global value chain, with Indonesia's participation declining since 2010, implying less foreign parts are being used in Indonesian produced goods, and likewise, less Indonesian produced parts are finding their way into other countries' end products abroad. So you may be thinking, if it's a commodity exporter at the end of a super cycle, and it isn't a key part of the world's value chain, how is Indonesia projected to be a top economy then? Why Indonesia's demographics are crucial? Two things are abundantly clear. Indonesia has a very large population, the largest in Southeast Asia, and that large population is a young one. The sheer size of Indonesia's population is a massive advantage, with domestic demand touted by economists as a key driver of economic growth especially given its historically underwhelming performance in exports. The growth of the labour force will also help stimulate Indonesia's economic growth and grow its middle class. It's estimated that around 90 million more middle class consumers will have sprung up by 2030, 
bringing the consuming class to around 135 million people, which will make the growth of Indonesia's middle class the third highest in the world, after India and China. Yet, this demographic dividend is time sensitive, as the nation's fertility rate has been on the same downward trajectory other countries experience when people get wealthier. By 2030, this fertility rate is set to hit 2.1, meaning Indonesia is in the middle of a demographic golden window of opportunity, where the productive labour force is at its peak. Equally important to this demographic trend is the nation's rate of urbanisation, amongst the fastest in the world. For example, the size of its urban land increased by around 1,000 square kilometres between 2000 and 2010, second only to China. This will raise the proportion of Indonesians living in cities from over 50% today to 70%. This will help increase the share of Indonesian GDP generated by urban areas from 74% to 86% in 2030. This rural to urban shift will accompany the trade-in of agricultural tools for higher paying service sector based roles. However, these demographic changes have brought with them a set of economic challenges Indonesia will need to address. What are Indonesia's demographic-induced challenges? The rise in any nation's population presents a challenge to policy and centralised planning, from school places to infrastructure to housing, though the key challenge for Indonesia is the concentration of demand for things like roads, electricity and sanitation, all in urban areas. At the beginning of the video, we mentioned that Jakarta is tipped by some to become the largest city on earth, a debatable prediction, but the general sentiment is correct. Such a rapid rate of expansion has strained public infrastructure, with the percentage of residents with access to clean water as the urbanisation rate has increased, dropping to 48%. Another excellent example of this is the city's crippling traffic jams, which can stretch for tens of miles and are rated the third worst in the world. Interestingly, the city's previous strategy to dealing with this revolved around operating a three-in-one system, where only cars carrying three or more passengers could use certain roads, something which actually led to an informal job opportunity known as a so-called jockey, where jockeys would act as passengers for hire. And as strange as this loophole-based career opportunity is, it leads us nicely onto a key point. A less talked about trend in Indonesia's trend to urbanise is the type of jobs migrants are ending up in. Tens of millions are in what economists call low-end service jobs, such as cleaners or valets. Jobs which are only marginally more productive than working as an agricultural labourer, which just goes to reflect Indonesia's struggle in creating enough high-value jobs to satisfy its growing labour force, which is partly a response to underdeveloped value chains and partly an unintentional consequence of the cautious approach the country has taken to growth. So, why does Indonesia prioritise stability over growth? Now, don't get us wrong, the nation is growing fast by international standards, recording about 5% growth for the last few years, down from the 6% during its commodity boom. However, this puts it outside of the inspirationally named 7% club of the world's fastest emerging economies. You see, Indonesia got really badly burnt in the 1997 Asian financial crisis. For years afterwards, it was considered the poster child of the crisis, with inflation reaching 58% in 1998, the stock market collapsed, and since then the financial services industry has never really recovered. Following on from this horrendous experience, the country's economic policies have consistently prioritised stability over growth in a trade-off between the two. For example, general government debt was reduced from about 90% of GDP in 2000 to less than 40% in 2019. In fact, the country is now a role model of macroeconomic stability, ranking number one in the world for its unbelievably stable inflation rate. However, there is a concern that this new normal of subdued growth will prevent it from realising its economic ambitions by 2030. What are Indonesia's wider challenges? As we've discussed on this channel before, investment plays a huge role in any economy, acting as more than just a financial stimulus by also providing new technology, ideas, business practices and wider multiplier effects to the economy. But this is where Indonesia's investment story takes a unique turn. The challenge Indonesia faces 
isn't that investment has been too low. Far from it. Its investment rate relative to GDP has actually increased compared to the average during the commodity boom years of 2003 to 2011. The trouble is that this higher investment rate has led to lower growth, which on the face of it is counterintuitive. The reason for this is provided by the nation's rising incremental capital output ratio. The ratio measures how much investment is needed to generate a given amount of economic growth, or basically the efficiency of investment. So why has its investment ratio fallen? Well, that's because a lot of investment is focused on constructing new high-rises rather than infrastructure or machinery and equipment where returns are likely to be larger. Plus, a great deal of this investment is actually reinvestment by existing businesses which, whilst important, usually isn't as return-focused as new foreign direct investment, with FDI averaging around 2% of GDP, a pretty modest figure. This lack of FDI is based on a lot of bureaucracy and entrenched protectionist attitudes which favour domestic firms to the detriment of the nation's competitiveness, a competitiveness which has literally had to navigate a difficult terrain. Indonesia's archipelago layout with mountainous jungle interior makes logistics a nightmare. You can't just build a train line from one part of the country to another. No, you have to build new roads, new railways, ports, offload on one island and transport to another. And remember, this is all within the country. Expensive. Not to mention that the country's infrastructure is still playing catch up with its development. Now, to be fair, based on the current government's policies, it looks like infrastructure has become a real priority, as historically, it's fair to say that Indonesia had underinvested, which is partly due to inefficient tax collection to fund infrastructure. You see, Indonesia only collects about 10% of its tax relative to GDP, which is low compared to international standards, especially with ambitions to be a top five economy. But with that being said, as more jobs are set to enter the formal economy, Things like tax revenues, labour productivity and job security are all set to improve, all to the benefit of the nation. So overall, Indonesia has historically underpunched its true weight on the world stage, which in part is because of its geography. But along with the rest of the region, this is changing. This change is being led by its favourable demographics, possessing a young, vibrant population, rapidly urbanising. This urbanisation presents an opportunity to pivot its economy away from its reliance on commodities to higher value chains. Though, so far, low-end service sector jobs have prevailed. Indonesia demonstrates impressive levels of macroeconomic stability, a legacy of the 1997 Asian financial crisis. Yet, Critics state this has come at a trade-off to higher growth, which poses a challenge to becoming a global economic power over the next decade and no longer punching below its weight. Either way, Indonesia's economy is definitely one to watch. Now it's over to you. Do you think Indonesia can successfully wean itself off commodity-based exports? Will things like automation and artificial intelligence threaten the creation of higher value chain industries along with the development of its middle class? Let us know in the comments below. The Alt Simplified team have really enjoyed making this video, so if you think we've earned it, leave us a like and consider subscribing. It really helps grow this channel. And as always, see you in the next video.